of climate resilience into WASH strategies and plans. Joao, the, the next slide, please. So I just wanted to uh, briefly, very briefly, situate this uh, webinar series and specifically webinar two today uh, within the flow diagram that you see on the screen, which is nothing that but the, the country uh, processes that we have uh, suggested to uh, work more closely and in a coordinated way and uh, integrate the climate and the WAS um, agendas, right? Uh, as we already commented last week, uh, everything should start with the stakeholder mapping and seeing uh, from the WAS perspective with which stakeholders we need to be working with um, just to, to work with uh, this integration. Sorry, I just went ahead too quickly. Um, I forgot to mention the interpretation button. Um, it seems that every week I'm forgetting about this logistical part. And please uh, notice that on the lower side of your screen, um, you have an interpretation uh, button where you can click uh, the translation uh, that you need. Also uh, to say that this uh, webinar series is uh, convened by uh, the Global Water Partnership, UNICEF and WaterAid. Sorry, I forgot to mention that quickly. So as we said, we are situating, we are situating this webinar uh, series and the webinar today within this um, flow diagram. Uh, last week, we had the first webinar on Tuesday and that the focus was the policy analysis. As you might remember, those of you who join us, uh, we had a chance to um, see opportunities and entry points for uh, water sanitation and hygiene within national climate policy. We saw um, entry points for nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. We had interesting case studies by Zambia, Fiji in the first session of the webinar and in the second one, uh, Brazil and Mexico. And um, they told us how they were working with this integration of, of was into climate policy. Today on webinar two, we're going to be uh, moving forward and we're going to pay close attention on existing tools and frameworks. We're going to be uh, seeing um, presentations on uh, methodologies for was risk assessments. And we will also have presentations that will give us some light on um, potential um, was solutions to uh, address identified climate risk. This will be on the webinar today. And then next week on Thursday, 29th of April, we will have the third webinar that will focus on finance of the WASP responses. The next slide, please. So as you can see, we have a, a busy agenda today. Um, I think we have a, a very good lineup a set of presentations, country case studies and discussions. We have two uh, initial presentations. The first one is on risk assessments for WAS led by uh, the Global Water Partnership. The second presentation is going to be on WAS climate resilience options and presenting a generic research framework for WAS climate resilience led by UNICEF. Then we have two very, very interesting case studies. The first one uh, coming from Jordan and Suez is uh, leading on, on this uh, presentation about the a Sandra wastewater treatment plan. And also from um, Eritrea, we have a very interesting case a study on the integration of climate resilience into the one WASP program. We have two key discussions uh, today. Uh, we will have uh, WHO making remarks on climate resilient water um, safety planning and sanitation safety planning. And we also have water rate making remarks on the water rate, water security framework and its implementation. Without further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor, um, next slide please, to um, Kidane, Kidane Jemperi, who is a technical advisor uh, at GWP, the Global Water Partnership Africa Coordination Unit in Southern Africa. So Kidane, the, the floor is, is yours for the next eight, maximum 10 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Please confirm if you can hear me properly. We can hear you very well. Thank very you. good. 
Thank you. So um, my name is Kirana Mariam, Kirana in short, uh, working for the Global Water Partnership um, Africa Coordination Unit. I'm based in, in South Africa. So I will be introducing the uh, climate risk analysis uh, for WASH. Uh, next slide, please. So as Jose tried to explain, um, that there is a whole process of the, the climate resilient uh, WASH development framework. Um, so my focus will be around the risk assessment for WASH, but my colleague will continue in terms of identification and the phrasing of climate resilience uh, WASH and then um, the next process. So my focus would be around how do we do the climate risk assessment for WASH. Next slide, please. Um, then before probably going to the risk assessment itself, um, it may be good probably to uh, try to have a common understanding what's a climate risk um, for all of us. Climate risk is, is the interaction of uh, hazard, a climate hazard, um, exposure, and vulnerability. I think it's, it's very useful to actually understand that uh, this graph is adapted from the um, IPCC, um, hazard, um, um, exposure, and vulnerability. So the climate analysis, risk analysis is basically trying to assess what is a hazard, the climate uh, hazard that, we, that will be damaging our wash systems, what is its nature, and what's its extent. And then it will also try to help us to understand who and what is exposed to those hazards, and then what is the extent of that exposure. And then in terms of vulnerability, it will also help us um, how vulnerable are the different systems, those exposed to the hazard. And finally, it will also try to assess um, the what capacities exist so that it can influence the climate risk. So basically, um, that's what climate risk is. So I will try to take you through the different process of how do you assess the hazard, how do you assess exposure and vulnerability and capacity, and finally, how do you do your risk analysis? Next slide, please. Um, again, another important thing to consider is as we do our assessment, um, exposure, vulnerability, capacity, it's always good to try to see the different components, for example. If you are saying exposure, um, so the hazard can affect environmental system, social system, human system, institutional or physical system. So it's always good to consider the different um, aspects or components of exposure components of vulnerability and also capacity uh, for us. For example, if I say um, exposure, I'm talking about um, flood exposure um, to communities, for example. And vulnerability, vulnerability, for example, communities that are residing in flood prone areas are more vulnerable to flood hazard. And capacity, those um, communities that are poor and they don't have means um, to respond to the flood hazard, they would be more damaged or, or affected by the, by the hazard. That's a kind of um, understanding and linkage between exposure, um, hazard exposure and vulnerability. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of the overall assessment, if you go to online, you'll find um, a Excel-based risk um, assessment, risk analysis tool that's developed jointly by UNICEF and GWP. There is also what is called a guidance note um, that will tell you how to carry out your risk assessment. Um, but there are two levels of assessment, the high-level assessment where you can try to score a high-level kind of scoring based on your assessment, but you can also go to a detailed um, climate risk analysis or assessment where you have to do different components and uh, sub aspects. So in terms of process, we'll try to identify the hazard and score it. Then we'll identify and score exposure, and then identify and score vulnerabilities and also capacities. And that at the end of the day, you do your climate risk analysis aggregated. And finally, you'll end up with having a prioritized list of climate risks for WASH program. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, how do you assess hazards? Um, that the different three steps basically. The first one is identification of hazard. You can identify hazard in the tool. You will find a list of hazards. Maybe you can pick uh, from that, but you can also add additional hazards um, you may anticipate. But the key is trying to understand and characterize the hazard. Uh, for example, if you take flood, um, what is the frequency of the flood? How long is the duration of the flood? Um, what's its intensity? 
was the geographical extent of the flood and then at which time of the year will this flood come. So that kind of characterization and understanding of the hazard is important. Then you can do scoring of the hazard. It can be high level or, or, or detail level scoring. Um, high level, um, like scoring one for one hazard based on different characteristics. But detail level is like we have to score for different characteristics of the hazard. Um, I'll skip it next, next slide, please. Um, then the last one is important is also assigning a confidence score. Confidence, especially how confident are we in terms of um, confidence to us as a hazard, particularly predicting flooding, for example, especially future hazard could be difficult. So it's better to actually associate with some kind of scoring um, with regards to that confidence level. I will not go into the details. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Then the next one is assessing exposure. Once you identify the hazard, you can identify um, what will this hazard uh, be impacting. So high level assessment, again, detail level kind of assessment. For example, if the hazard is flooding, you can identify um, the different exposures. For example, it can be people could be exposed to the flooding hazard, or infrastructure can be exposed to the flooding hazard or environmental aspects. So you identify those exposures. And then you do a scoring, high level, as I said, um, one hazard, um, one score. And if it's detailed one, you have to go to the detail characteristics of the, 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 the exposure and you can, you can. So you'll get more um, indicators for identification of the hazard in the tool, if you like. Um, the next slide, please. I'm trying to introduce this quickly. And then going to vulnerability, um, that's also a similar process. Um, high level assessment and detailed level assessment. The high level assessment, for example, if you are considering environmental system, vulnerability assessment for environmental system, you have to identify the, the aspects of vulnerability, the elements of vulnerability, and you can also identify key questions, for example, environmental related uh, elements and questions, the rate of environmental degradation, for example, or you can pose a question, are water sources adequately protected, for example, and then if your assessment is like um, high environmental degradation, if water, water sources are not adequately protected, that means that environmental system is highly vulnerable to climate change impact. Um, and but detail level assessment, you have to score for different elements and questions separately because you want to do a detailed kind of assessment. So again, um, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm just trying to save some time. And then finally, the related to capacity assessment again. Um, this is very important to note. Capacity assessment is mainly linked to identification of climate resilient wash options, for example. Um, so um, it's not actually influencing the priority of the climate risk, but climate assessment as part of our mitigation strategy or addressing climate resilient wash options. So again, high level and detail level assessment, for example, if you consider social system capacity assessment at that level, you can check the different elements, for example, are, are any community preparedness plans exist? And if there are any social networks in plan, for example, if there's flood, communities can um, work on, on as networks and respond quickly, collectively, um, and then they have better capacity that means. So those aspects you have to consider in, in, in your assessment. Let me go to the next slide, please. Um, then um, the risk assessment overall is like you assess your hazard, you have your scoring, there is exposure, your, your description in the scoring, you did your vulnerability assessment, the description and the scoring, and finally you aggregate that one. As we said, risk is interaction of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. That means you multiply all those scores and you'd get overall scoring for risk. For risk. And then based on that scoring, you will rank your climate risks. And then number one um, climate risk, you will consider it um, as a priority in terms of identifying your climate resilient options and taking some actions to address those. those. But important thing is like, it's a very participatory process. You have to get different stakeholders in this process. And you always have to ask a, a number of questions. For example, are you happy with this list of climate risks you identified? If not, you have to go back and check your assessment. 
Um, do you want to see other risks to be included in the priority list or should be removed, some of them? So that's important to note, actually, as you identify the climate risk, prioritize to check whether you are happy or not with the, with the, with the list you have. And the, the last slide, if you go to the next one, um, sensitivity analysis is also important. Sensitivity analysis, particularly if you are not really um, um, agreeing with the different stakeholders, you may check your scoring process again. Uh, probably you may have to consider some of the elements of uh, your scoring process. For example, if you scored flooding based on intensity frequency, and your scoring, if you are not happy, you may check and consider the aspect of geographical extent, for example, for flooding. And if you consider scoring using geographical extent, then you may end up with a different uh, priority list of um, risks. So that sensitivity analysis is always important. It can be done at different levels as you do your um, hazard um, exposure and vulnerability, but you can also do it as you conclude it overall climate risk analysis. And just the end, I'm taking a bit of time, um, but probably then I'll come back later on during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to you, Kidane, for, for this uh, presentation. As we have seen, this is a very practical tool. Uh, this webinar, webinar two, we have promised that it could be on practical ways to get uh, uh, climate resilience integrated into water strategies and plans. But we also need to remember that last week during the first webinar, when we were doing a deep dive into uh, looking for entry points uh, for WASP into climate uh, national policy, we already said that it could be, it's very important that the WASP sector has analyzed the risk. The WASP sector understands what are the climate hazards that are impacting um, the WASP infrastructure, the WASP services, and also different, um, different uh, ways of impacting the population. And Kitana has explained very well how vulnerability plays a key role and capacity can uh, somehow help address and, and reduce the, the risk. So conducting WASP risk analysis is a bridge between these webinars because it's an entry point for climate policy and it's uh, obviously uh, an entry point um, for integrating climate resilience into water strategies and plans. Not only that, it's also a bridge for what we will see next week on webinar three, because webinar three will focus on climate financing. And we will see then, and we already discussed last week, how the water sector needs, needs to be ready to explain and articulate what is the climate rationale and what is the climate narrative, as uh, one of our speakers mentioned last week, what is the climate narrative of WAS interventions? By having this uh, risk analysis conducted, uh, and having all this information in hand, what are the hazards, what are the different frequency, um, duration, intensity of climate hazards, what is the expose, what is the exposure levels, what are the exposure levels, who is exposed, and um, which sort of uh, what services are exposed, and then what is the vulnerability and the capacity, give us all this narrative that we will need and we will see next week is needed for climate financing. Thank you again um, very much. Um, Joao, if we can go to the next slide. Now I want to present um, to Dauda. Dauda Jawara is um, was a specialist in UNICEF, um, uh, West and Central Africa Regional Office. Um, Dauda is going to uh, present to us um, an strategy framework to work with um, climate resilient WASH. And he's going to um, make a special emphasis in the topic that we are discussing to, to today, which is the different options um, that we may have to work uh, with um, WASH climate resilient solutions, solutions to address the risk that we have identified using methodologies such as the one that Kidane has just presented. But now um, I give you the floor. Uh, Dauda, thank you very much for joining us and for your uh, presentation today. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Um, okay, thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure, obviously, to uh, be able to present uh, the strategic framework for climate resilient wash development, uh, but also uh, importantly today, just to have a quick look at the uh, results framework, because I think that's a very important uh, aspect of this. 
Um, now, the, 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 the objective of this presentation is just very briefly to see how you can identify appropriate um, uh, solutions or uh, appropriate options uh, uh, to address uh, adaptation to climate risk and uh, also mitigation as well. I mean, we have to um, remember that that's also an important uh, aspect of uh, climate resilience. Um, and then also to present this framework, which will show you how you can adapt, you know, the various, uh, how you can look at uh, address risks and, and also uh, develop solutions uh, in your particular uh, context. Um, next slide. So the framework, ne ne next please. Yeah, the framework that uh, we're looking at today um, is already has quite wide application. Um, it, I think the previous speakers have mentioned that it's uh, developed by Global Water Partnership and UNICEF, but it is actually uh, not for our exclusive use. It is uh, for general use. Um, so it's available um, to the entire wash uh, sector. It's available in French, Spanish and Portuguese. That is the main uh, framework document, uh, but various technical briefs are in the process of being translated from the from English. Um, I think some of the uh, these briefs are being updated and adapted. So I think that is also slowing down the translation process, but I think the objective is that it's going to be as widely available um, as possible. Now, if you just look at the figure on the right side of the screen, um, you see that it comprises uh, four quadrants, and I think it's quite easy to understand. Um, you know, it, it's quite intuitive. The first quadrant, this is the one um, in the sort of, uh, in the red, uh, color um, is about understanding the problem of climate resilient or wash. Um, and this involves, uh, you know, sort of stakeholder uh, mapping, understanding who the stakeholders are. Uh, the other issue is identifying priorities uh, at that country level. Um, this was the subject of last week's uh, webinar. It's a very important uh, aspect, particularly, you know, if you want to present uh, you know, proposals for financing. And uh, another aspect uh, here is uh, the risk analysis, um, which uh, Kidani has uh, presented uh, just now. Uh, so the next quadrant, this is the one in the blue, is about, um, you know, it's about identifying solutions. Um, now, this is a broad subject also, and uh, we'll uh, look at that a little bit later. Uh, the third uh, quadrant is about implementing solutions that you have identified, screened, and, 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 and eventually want to implement. And the last quadrant uh, is, the, uh, is about monitoring uh, and also learning lessons about uh, what is implemented and planned. Uh, next slide, please. So now let's look a little bit at um, the issue of options. Um, there are obviously many ways in which you can group uh, you know, solutions, uh, but what we uh, recommend is that you uh, have three key objectives in, in mind. The first one is ensuring the sustainability and safety and resilience to climate risk of the uh, infrastructure uh, services and behaviors. Uh, and wash uh, infrastructure services and behaviors. Um, this is obviously related to making sure that uh, um, resources are used in a sustainable way, uh, that they're protected. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, in some cases, it also has implications for uh, the disposal of waste. Next. Uh, sorry, no, so, sorry. The, so so, so the, the, the sort of uh, second um, uh, objective um, is about ensuring that uh, communities are actually resilient. I mean, there's no point uh, doing doing it unless uh, that is the objective. And uh, building that resilience, um, you know, is, uh, is 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 a very key objective. And it means also ensuring that uh, uh, you know safeguarding the, um, the you know the rights to, um, to 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 service provision of uh, vulnerable groups. I mean, that's uh, very important. 
uh, but also resilience has a broader uh, sort of aspect. Um, it's not just the uh, that the, that the uh, infrastructure has to be um, to to be resili resilient, but we can contribute to this, you know, in terms of building capacity, uh, providing opportunities for income generation, um, and just general sort of ecosystem uh, resilience. Now, the third aspect um, that I alluded to uh, earlier, and we must always keep this in mind, is that uh, one of the key objectives of uh, the whole climate movement is uh, working towards a low carbon, uh, you know, a, a low carbon world, and uh, the wash sector should not be an exception uh, to this. And uh, the issues of uh, ensuring efficiency in uh, use of water and in you know in, in, in energy for producing water uh, are very important. Uh, uh, you know issues, and this could also include, for example, um, you know generation of energy from waste. Uh, next, now looking at the framework, I'm not expecting you to be able to read all of this, but basically, what I the message here is that uh, it's sort of broken down into sort of three uh, sort of levels of uh, of, of of action. Um, the framework is quite flexible; it's quite generic. Um, it's quite adjustable to your country context. Every country has a very different context in terms of institutional mandates, in terms of the degree of decentralization and so on. So, um, but this framework, I think, allows you to, you know, to, 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 to work around and, and, and situate your own particular context in it. And it essentially looks at three sort of general categories of levels of action. The first is the national level. Secondly, sub-national level. Um, or and or uh, sort of you know basin or watershed uh, level, and the third is a sort of more local and project uh, level. Uh, next slide. So looking in more detail at those three uh, levels, um, at national level, I think what you're trying to do is to make sure that you have an enabling environment uh, that will enable uh, climate resilient wash services. Uh, you know, to be uh, provided. Now, the sort of activities that uh, you would be uh, promoting at national level uh, would be looking at, for example, gen generally what sort of technologies are appropriate to your particular country, uh, what sort of uh, strategies and policies um, do you want to uh, adopt, um, the whole issue of finance, uh, you know, the, we're talking about some additional uh, costs and uh, you know, it's not just a question of uh, of generating external finance, but also making financial provision uh, at national level. That's uh, also important, and also uh, just the sort of issue of early warning systems. These are sort of general uh, issues that are most uh, properly addressed at, at at the national level. Now, at the more sort of uh, local and sub uh, sub national level. Um, that's where you sort of do the kind of analysis that Kidani was talking about, uh, looking at the risks, um, also just monitoring sort of availability and quality of water, monitoring how that water and is, is used or how resources, wash resources in general are used, but also, um, you know, local level planning. And then at the local level, um, this is where you're looking at uh, you know, you know, more specific areas that are much more targeted in terms of, for example, storage systems, um, looking at uh, climate uh, affected uh, uh, communities, uh, communities that are sort of, you know, very vulnerable uh, within a particular area to climate hazards, um, looking at sort of technologies, climate smart technologies, solar uh, panels and so on. Um, Interesting issue here also is how do you reduce vulnerability through improved uh, sanitation and hygiene? So also very important. And uh, something else that we might consider is um, you know planning, uh, you know sort of safety planning, uh, you know at, at at community level. So I hope that's given a sort of general uh, overview of uh, what the framework can offer. Uh, and we'll be happy to answer some questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Zaza. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very interesting presentation. And then we, we continue seeing practicalities and practical tools and practical ways. 
um, that the wash sector has to um, identify and appraise uh, solutions, right? First, we have seen how to identify the risk. And once we have identified the risk, we need to find the solutions. This is uh, one framework. This is one tool that, um, as you have said, uh, the Global Water Partnership and UNICEF have uh, developed. Um, and later on, we are going to hear um, about other frameworks and other approaches that um, other organizations have also um, are also working with. Um, again, this is uh, this part of the of the webinar today with these two presentations kick off a discussion. And I would like to see how uh, if uh, you know if you keep on interacting in the chat box, and if you uh, would like to reflect on how the countries where you're working have advanced in this front of uh, conducting risk specific risk analysis for the WAS sector, if you think that you are clear on what are the main hazards and how those main climate hazards impact uh, population and water services in your countries and whether you think um, you know uh, you have already gone ahead and after identifying those you've been able to prepare and frame uh, what's climate resilient solutions that has explained different ways to package the solutions right whether they are according to objectives whether it's uh, climate resilient infrastructure and services whether it's more broadly looking at how to increase the climate resiliency of communities, or whether it's um, contributing to lowering carbon emissions, or this other way that uh, Tada has uh, presented of preparing kind of a theory of change and articulating what's climate resilient solutions at different levels, the national, subnational, and local level. Indeed, what Tada has presented can be also an interesting tool and a way to link to what we will see on webinar three next week as climate financing proposals will need to be articulated along the lines of uh, what Dada has just explained and you will be asked to develop theories of change where you will have to demonstrate how a set of activities contribute to a set of outcomes and um, outputs and, and an overall outcome. So you may well take into consideration tools and frameworks and results frameworks such as the one that Data has presented as a practical tool to kick off the discussions in country of, uh, in your respective countries um, as a way to start preparing uh, proposals for uh, green climate financing. Uh, this concludes uh, the first part of uh, the webinar, which is these two key presentations. And now we are going to jump into the two um, country uh, case studies that we have lined up for you. This first one, um, as we have already mentioned earlier, is um, is actually picking up on the second most water scarce country in the world, which is Jordan. We are very lucky to have with us uh, with us uh, Paul Bourguignon, who is um, the chief executive uh, officer of Suez for Africa and the Near East. And Paul will be uh, presenting on the Asamra wastewater treatment plant in Jordan. Um, let me tell you right before uh, giving the floor to Paul that Suez is uh, one of the world leaders in services to the environment. Uh, in Jordan, is present uh, since uh, the 90s with uh, several partnerships to find solutions to the problem of water scarcity that I was mentioning. Um, and this comprises both water treatment and wastewater treatment, reuse and, and also water production. We will see today how in such an scarce con um, context and with climate change impacting this, um, the reuse of wastewater is fundamental. Today, uh, Suez has two contracts um, in Jordan for the production of drinking water in the far south of the country to transfer uh, water from the Red Sea to the capital Amman. And then the focus of the presentation today is in the Ars Sanra wastewater treatment plant, which is um, what uh, Paul is going to present us today, making emphasis also on the contributions to um, climate mitigation and obviously bearing in mind uh, the, the importance of uh, wastewater treatment and reuse. So without further ado, Paul, thanks for uh, participating in this webinar today and the floor is yours. We will pass the slides for you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well, Paul. 
Excellent. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to be uh, with you today uh, in this webinar uh, uh, to talk about uh, an experience uh, effectively in Jordan that, that we are very proud of uh, at Suez. Uh, as Jose mentioned, uh, uh, obviously Suez has a lot of uh, history in Jordan and we've been effectively present in the water sector for more than 25 years. And today we have a role effectively uh, managing some wells and an aquifer in the south of the country and then sending the water via a pipe to Amman. And then secondly, in uh, the wastewater treatment part, which is what I am going to talk about uh, in our presentation later. So we're involved in the whole water cycle. And I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting uh, uh, subject because effectively, as, as Jose said, uh, um, Jordan suffers from uh, uh, massive water scarcity. And, and so I think it's a great example of how a country can can build a strategy, uh, uh, even in a difficult situation, uh, to build a, a climate resilient, let's say, uh, uh, water and wastewater solutions. If we move to the next slide, please. So just to give you um, a few statistics on, on the Jordan situation, um, the population is currently about 10 million people. It's been growing uh, quite fast in, in the last years, about 3% per year, and in particular, including a lot of obviously uh, immigration, particularly from, uh, from uh, countries such as Syria. Um, separately, you've had uh, strong urbanization, in particular the capital has been growing very fast. And if you add to those two effects that, that, that we find, uh, you heard I'm in charge of Africa and, and the Near East, uh, these effects we are experiencing in many of the countries in the region. And if you add to that, obviously the effect of, that I'm hearing some. Mm. If you, if you add to that the effects of climate change, obviously, it makes a, a very complex challenge. And, and we can see actually the amount of water available in the country is, is actually uh, per person going down year on year. You can see we're talking about 110 cubic meters of water per inhabitant per year. I think even according to a recent WASH estimates, a reasonable amount, even in a very stressed country, is about 500 cubic meters of water per year. So we are well, well, well below what uh, even uh, UNICEF recommends as a minimum to be able to run the necessary requirements for inhabitants in a country. And when you look at how it's split out, you can see in the two graphs at the bottom of the page, uh, on the one hand, in terms of use of resources on the left, you can see farming and irrigation uses up more than 50% of water resources. You have domestic consumption at 40% and you have small industrial consumption of 4%. And that represents, if you take the 110 cubic meters per day, we're talking about a billion cubic meters across the country per year. Uh, and today, most of that is coming from groundwater, which are obviously being overexploited, uh, even though the, the countries work very hard, but they still need to further implement solutions to reduce the drawing on the groundwater, maybe increase the share of treated wastewater reuse, which I'm gonna talk about, maybe increase the desalination. They have some big projects in that area and, and obviously the surface water is affected by the climate change but what we need to imagine is over the over the long term the, the, the graphs need to change significantly. If we go to the next slide I think from a very positive perspective that the Jordanian authorities have been working with a strategic vision for many years on how to manage their water and wastewater sector. Um, the World Bank has very, been very involved, many international uh, financial institutions have been involved and have supported the, the Jordanian government in building up a whole set of projects to manage within the, the difficult context that I explained. And you can see that uh, in their current plan to improve the situation by 2030, they have four key areas which they're working on. Number one is reducing the amount of water taken from, from the ground. As I mentioned, they are, they are probably over extracting today. And the way they, they can achieve that is number one by reducing leach leakages in the network, same problem as many places across the world, uh, reduce the non-revenue water, reduce the physical losses, reduce the commercial losses. Number two is potentially looking at some extra desalination, but number three, and I think a very interesting one is, is increased reuse for agriculture. Um, obviously, uh, reuse for uh, direct potable water reuse, we at Suez, for instance, wouldn't necessarily totally recommend it, but for many other uses, such as agriculture, such as industry, such as for uh, parks and gardens, uh, and even for uh, re-injecting into aquifers, we, we, we strongly recommend. And I think this, this project that I'm going to explain to you is, is a great example of that, 
and something that we would recommend in many places. If we can go to the next slide, maybe. To succeed in these long-term projects is obviously very important uh, to have all of the stakeholders aligned with strong objectives to make the project work. We are talking about a project which was built in, in a build, operate, transfer, BOT uh, format by the Jordanian authorities for Asamra. So there was originally a, 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 a old wastewater treatment plant treating some of the wastewater of Amman. Um, they decided in the early 2000s, the Jordanian authorities, uh, with the support of international institutions, to completely review and redo uh, their whole uh, wastewater treatment solution, to upgrade it to a solution which was capable of treating wastewater to a high quality, to a quality that could be reused for agriculture and industry, obviously, including notably, uh, let's say, tertiary treatment. Um, at an affordable price, because obviously we're in a country where uh, they couldn't afford to pay uh, uh, over excessive costs for this solution. So it had to be uh, a solution which is also optimized from a, a cost perspective and which took into, a, into account a, a number of other factors, for instance, the expected continued growth in population um, and also a number of climate issues, including uh, minimizing energy consumption in a country which again, similar to the lack of water resources has limited energy resources. So the, the government built up a, a whole plan for a BOT project um, to build a first plant for about 270,000 cubic meters per day of wastewater treatment, um, which was most of the wastewater being produced by the city of Amman at the time. Um, we and our partners, uh, CCC, uh, Morganti, uh, uh, Lebanese uh, group, uh, uh, one, the, the, the tender to perform the BOT over 25 years with a, with a three-year construction period and a 22-year operations and maintenance period. And um, I think working with uh, the Jordanian uh, uh, Ministry of Water and Irrigation, uh, who uh, set up strong governance for the project, and I think the strong governance was very important. They set up a dedicated project management team uh, they implemented uh, best practice for running PPP projects, um, facilitating uh, structuring to enable uh, the raising of, of um, private finance. Um, they even implemented processes with international uh, financial institutions to obtain some grants to make the project even more cost effective. Uh, and obviously, uh, equally important, they made sure they had in place uh, a project system which secured uh, long-term payments over 25 years and facilitated the administrative processes about setting up that project. So I think, uh, honestly, the, the Jordanian authorities have to be congratulated for the foresight and the way they structured that project. I think it was very important to in implement this, this kind of uh, a project. It was also very important, the support given by the banks in the setting up well-structured, flexible and, and attractive financing uh, supported also by the international financial institutions, I said so. It was really a teamwork to build this project. I think the, the first project was a, a great success. We implemented it, we built it, uh, we financed it. Uh, we've been operating it ever since. It was, it was a great success to extend that. Uh, 10 years later, the Jordan, Jordanian authorities asked us and our partners to make an extension to that plant. So we, um, uh, negotiated with them and agreed on an extension to increase it by 100,000 cubic meters per day. So probably potentially increasing the capacity of the plant from let's say two and a half to three and a half million inhabitants. Um, and also increasing uh, the sludge capacity uh, on the plant um, and extending the contract to 2037. And I think this, the Jordanian authorities continue to believe it is an excellent plant uh, and hence we are currently in discussions with them, potentially talking about making another extension of 100,000 cubic meters per day to the plant as the population continues to grow as wastewater uh, produced in Amman continues to increase. If we go to the next slide, we can maybe talk about why, why everyone is so satisfied by the project. This plant actually uh, treats 70% of the wastewater in Jordan, dealing mainly with a population of, of Amman. So it is by far the biggest and the most important wastewater treatment plants in Amman. All of the wastewater that is treated 
is used for reuse for irrigation, um, which if you remember the graph I showed a little bit earlier means that we are providing uh, almost 20% uh, of the water which is required for irrigation. You saw maybe in another slide that I think they would like to increase the share of irrigation coming from reused water. Um, obviously, if we make an extension to the plant, we can increase that, but I think it's an example of perfect circular economy where all of the wastewater is then reused and put back in the economy, which is even more important than in a, in a place like Jordan, where obviously, as we said, there's very limited water resources. Equally, as I mentioned, we work very hard on making it as autonomous as possible in terms of energy. I was listening to my, uh, the person who talked before me who, who mentioned how it's important in terms of working on energy resources. Well, we have implemented solutions with our partners to make this 87% autonomous in terms of energy, notably by uh, producing energy from the biogas resulting from the waste treatment process, but also by uh, collecting the energy at the beginning and the end of the process. So we're currently at 87% and we continue to work to optimize. Obviously that minimizes, minimizes the amount of energy that we require from the networks. And it also leads to the next point, which is clearly that by not having to uh, use energy being produced by other sources, we potentially save more than 40,000 tons of CO2 that might've been emitted by, by, by that process. So I think from a, a climate change and resilience perspective, both in terms of reuse in terms of uh, uh, energy sufficiency and also saving uh, impacts on the climate, it's, it's, it's very positive, uh, this plant. Um, we also obviously work on a number of other issues in terms of social and environmental responsibility. For us, working in a place like Asamra, uh, uh, outside Amman, uh, working with the local communities, incorporating the plant and, and the way we work into the local communities, uh, and, and, and helping them with their problems is a key part of the whole process. And you can see I've mentioned a number of items in the slides, how we train and we work with the local schools. Uh, we provide social support and obviously uh, we, we deal with local environmental issues with, with, with our local partners. Um, I think it's also obviously exciting in terms of the way we're able to create uh, local jobs, 226 jobs created around this plant. Uh, virtually everyone is local Jordanian. Um, and obviously we work a lot and very hard on transferring know-how and expertise to all of those local employees to run that plant uh, in the local communities. Um, naturally, we have all of the ISO uh, ratings that I put down there um, and, and we work with all the authorities to, to recommend this, this plant, which I can only recommend that if you have the opportunity, please go and, and visit it because we are, we are very pr proud of this plant. Maybe you can go to the final slide. So if I haven't been too long. Next slide, please. So just in terms of key factors of success, as I've said, I think the long-term spirit of partnership, which was developed by the Jordanian authorities, by the local partners, by our partners, by the international financial institutions, I think was very, very important how everyone worked together to build a project with a long-term governance and long-term vision. It was also important to have flexibility so that we work together to try and solve problems because every long-term project has its problems, but I think they've been very successfully worked out between the parties. As I said, it has to be linked, integrated into the local environment, the local community, has to take into account climate resilience. Uh, finally, I would mention it's important to be able to implement a, an attractive tariff. And I think uh, the, the, the obtaining of grants and the innovative energy solutions have allowed us to have a plant which operates and which can be structured at, at an attractive tariff. And I would just conclude with one last comment. I think wastewater reuse, as, as probably the person before me was saying as well, is something that we have not developed enough in the world. It is really a great opportunity to combine um, a solution which deals with hygiene and health issues in terms of wastewater treatment and deals with the resource issue in terms of providing new water sources in places which do not have enough water. So I really would insist and, and push uh, to you all that, that we really need to push hard to develop more wastewater reuse solutions across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And I think you have concluded <laughs> in a very nice way. Uh, last week uh, during our webinar on climate policy and, and trying to find entry ways for uh, water sanitation and hygiene, international climate policy, we already discussed the lack of uh, sanitation in climate uh, policy. 
at national level. So you have, um, through your presentation, you have given us, uh, you know, a good oversight on how sanitation can be reflected, you know, the importance of um, wastewater treatment and its reuse, uh, mostly uh, for irrigation, but as you say, free in a space for uh, drinking water. Um, so as we know in the water balance equation, all the water that you are able to uh, treat and reduce is water uh, that it, it's, it's free for drinking purposes. So thank you very much for this very interesting case study, also highlighting the contributions to uh, reducing greenhouse gases emissions through efficient uh, operations in, in your uh, water and wastewater treatment processes, not only efficient operation, uh, efficient energy, uh, but also uh, increasing the efficiency of your, the water processes. So thank you very much, Paul. We really appreciate your, your inputs to, to this webinar series. And uh, if, we, if we can have uh, the next slide, um, Joao. So now we have, um, we have another very, very interesting case study coming from uh, Eritrea. We are very lucky to have a um, director general. C'est bon pour moi. We are very lucky to have a uh, director general, Mr. Mibrahu Iyasu, yeah. who is um, yeah. working from the Ministry um, of Land, mm -hmm. Water and Environment in Eritrea in the, the, in the Department of uh, Water Resources. So, Mr. Mebrahu, to the, the floor is yours now. And we will pass the slides for you. Nous allons passer les visuels pour vous. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui, oui, nous vous entendons. Merci beaucoup. As you have already mentioned, my name is Mebrahu Iyasu from Eritrea. My presentation is on Eritrea One was strategy and investment plan. Please slide. Yeah. No, there is one slide before this, I think. Okay. No, no. I think. We have the background on, on the slide, director. We have the Pardon? background of we have the background of the um, of uh, the, the one was initiative uh, on the screen. Okay. You have skipped one we one slide, director. We are using the um, we are using the um, slides you had earlier, sir, with us. So I understand that mm, there may have been. Uh, a new set of slides that you you forward. So, if uh, if you prefer us to take down this presentation and then you share your screen, otherwise we have the um, the presentation that you sent to us uh, yesterday, as you prefer, director. We can continue with these slides that we have, or if you prefer to share your screen, please let us know. Yeah, we we are just trying to yeah. set up and uh, just present our own presentation. Just just few seconds, please please bear with us. No, no problem. No problem. We are happy to to take um, our slide deck down if you, if you prefer to use your slide deck and then uh, share the screen. You just let us know what it's um, more convenient uh, for you. Just in the meantime, just to say that Eritrea, um, we have uh, highlighted this case study because we understand Eritrea has done a, a great job in integrating climate resilience into um, what it's called the One Was uh, program. Um, also, yeah. a, a similar program is being implemented in Ethiopia. So that's why we've been in touch with Eritrea. We are really lucky and happy to have um, this presentation, this case study for you today. So can can this slide be taken out because I'm, we are unable to unable to share our screen? It says, no, no, we can continue. No problem. Now we now we can. Yeah. Now you can share the the slide from your side.
Thank you. If you can please maximize so that we see the full screen with the presentation. Now we, we have the cover of your presentation. You can go into present presenter mode so that we see the full screen. In the meantime, I invite all the participants to continue interacting in the chat box. We are having a very interesting discussion. And if you also have some questions about um, or comments about the presentation um, that Suez just did on this Jordan and the previous Jordan case study, please go ahead. I think, I think uh, just I can start with what I have. Perfect, director. Then the floor is yours. Just, yeah. just to, to let you know, if, if possible, that would you could uh, maximize the the screen so that we just see the slide, we see the background um, of your um, of your computer. But in, in, otherwise, yes, please go ahead. It's fine. You can go ahead, director. It's fine. If you can pass the slides from your end, that's that's perfectly fine. Jose, yes. Uh, I think this slide is actually in an email. That's why it cannot be maximized. I, I would suggest that in the interest of time, um, that the director just, as you had suggested, he just uh, speaks to it. Otherwise, they would have to download it. Okay, they That's fine. Thanks, Itali. Thank you, director. You can go ahead. Thank you, Josie, and uh, yeah, even for your patience. Well, as I said before, uh, today I'm presenting the wash strategy of Eritrea. The main objective of this is to inform the SWAC partners Eritrea practical ways to integrate climate resilience into wash policies, strategies, and plans. And at the same time, seek partners to share country experience. In saying that, I just want to introduce you with some of the country background for the initiative. The government of the state of Eritrea is committed to achieve the SDG targets for WASH by <coughs> 2030, and considerable progress is made in the WASH sector. The government ensure WASH-related issues are prioritized in all national development in the initiatives, but still there are remaining gaps that need further address. As a background continuation of the initiative of one wash strategy and investment plan is an integrated framework for coordinated wash actions in the country. The core objectives of this one wash is to serve as a guide for the allocation of human, physical, and financial resource, efficient and effective Im implementation, and timely follow-ups and monitoring and evaluation of its progress. In the development process of the one wash strategy and investment plan, we have conducted a series of workshops. One was wash bottleneck analysis and desk review. And that was followed by consultative workshops with all the stakeholders, including the urban, rural, and wash in institutions actors. One was uh, strategy and implementation plan reflects the following strategic shifts. First, focusing on evidence and data that include trends in climate change, urbanization and economic growth, improving wash enabling environment, establishing sustainable and integrated wash services, 
and strengthening technical capacity and system responses. In addition, improving sustainable and equitable wash financing. The one wash strategy has its priorities. One is geological mapping of water resource in the context of climate change predictions. The second one is groundwater is protected from over exploitation, pollution, and can be also recharged. Here, community sens sensitization, behavior change campaigns, and social mobilizations have been also conducted. Future effects of climate change, disaster risk management must also become a fundamental element of wash related program. Invest, like investing in technology resilient to potential threats posed by climate change. The one wash initiative is among the top priorities of the nation linked to the national policy which has already in place. One is the national adaptation plan, nationally determined contribution. The government is also aware that the anticipated high probability of drought and flooding risks. Therefore, it's working to deal with the contemporary challenge through its sector institutes and relevant stakeholders in collaboration with our development partners. Water conservation campaigns and social and water conservation activities have continuously implemented since independence. Well, I don't know if you can see, but there are some illustrations demonstrating the, the campaigns which were going on since the independence. Colleagues, are you able to see the slides? Yes, we can see the slides. Thank you. In one, the one wash strategy has, yeah, the initiatives as a continuation of what have been already mentioned as top priorities is one, Eritrea conducted a series of national and sectoral consultancy <coughs> workshops by involving government institutions and development partners. Among this, which I, has recently been conducted is the climate resilient water supply, water resource management. The proceeding is already prepared. This was the result of an in-depth and extensive work and synergy of participant institutions, committee members, professionals, and effective management. In line with this, wash costing and wash inventory is all, have, all, uh, have already started and is on process. <coughs> Well, when we say this, well, yeah, I think you can see that uh, as an illustration that the water supply infrastructure standards are climate resilient, as you can show, as you can see in the slide. Having said that, the one was initiative. Yeah, I think you can also see a, a, another slide which shows that the source of how we really try to recharge our source of or the groundwater by con, uh, conducting or doing some soil and water conservation structures in the upstream of uh, the what uh, in the upstream in the of the watershed that is to enrich the groundwater so that the water supply systems can have adequate water as a source. Well, 
just to demonstrate or to, to make sure that our water supply systems are climate resi the, uh, resilient. We, are, we have been introducing since the last 10 years, just shifting from the diesel or to uh, solar pumping systems. In the yeah, while preparing the one was strategy and investment plan, uh, we had we have had really major policy strategies and program documents in place, and that are. Uh, the main base of our preparation of the one wash. To mention them are already in place, National Environmental Management Plan, Eritrea Integrated Water Resource Management Action Plan, Eritrea Water Policy and Water Law are in place, National Adaptation Plan in place, Eritrea ODF roadmap is also uh, in place and we are expecting this to be full, fully implemented by 2022. Eritrea watch bottleneck analysis is prior to uh, preparing the one watch strategy was conducted and the whole report was prepared and that was the main ground for us for preparing the one watch strategy investment plan. At the same time, dealing with the climate change, the third national communication on climate change, impact, vulnerability, adaptation, and the mitigation measures are already in place. In that, the approval for water related by IPP is already also in place. <clears throat> Furthermore, community-based waste management in rural areas and community awareness strategies and implementation are also in place. For this, all already mentioned initiatives, the total budget required is about 674.357 million is required to fulfill, fully implement the strategy. Here, the financial oversight and accountability to one wash rests with the wash interministerial working committee. The interministerial working committee will develop policies and strategies for financing the sector, including mechanisms to leverage additional sector resources within the framework of the three things, that is taxes, tariffs, and transfers. The primary source of funding expected include first government of Eritrea. We really try to rely on ourselves first. We have also partners, grants and loans is also a source of our funding. Equity from utilities, community financial contributions is also one of our source for our funding. Director. Uh uh, sorry to interrupt. We will need um, to conclude us um, if you can in the next uh, in the next minutes. If you can, yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I I, I like to mention that uh, while doing this, we have been facing challenges. One is critical evidence and data gaps across the waste sector. Second is weak sector coordination mechanism, inadequate technology and innovations, shortage of resource and COVID-19 pandemic. From here, I think what we would like to uh, explain is that the lessons learned that could help replicating the initiative is, one is joint planning of relevant sector stakeholders is useful and effective. Coordinated engagement of stakeholders saves human and financial resources and avoid redundance, 
involving sector holders from all settings enrich the strategy. Involving of development partners helps in sharing experience and enrich transfer of knowledge. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director General. That was, uh, that was a very useful presentation and it really shows how ERITRA has been able to, to integrate climate resilience into such an important uh, one boss strategy. Uh, thanks also for sharing the lessons learned that will help replicate this initiative in, in other countries. As you have mentioned, joint planning or these consultative processes that you have also explained go very well with what we have seen during this webinar today, those consultative processes for uh, participatory risk assessments, etc. So uh, we really thank you again. Uh, director from, from your contributions and, and your presentation today. If, uh, Thank you. Of course, um, um, if there are questions um, from the participants, please uh, use the chat box. Um, we have now concluded this uh, second part of, uh, of the webinar, which is these two very interesting case studies from Jordan and from Eritrea. Uh, we also see uh, there is a lot of interaction in the chat box um, and questions about the risk analysis methodology and the options. Um, we would like to open the microphones perhaps for a few minutes at the end, but at this point, I will ask uh, my colleague Joao to load our presentation again. Um, as we are going to um, give the floor uh, now to our first discussion, Rory Moses uh, McEvoon who is Senior Technical Consultant at the World Health Organization. Um, uh, Rory, if, uh, if you would like to share any reflections of what you have uh, seen so far during this webinar, mm -hmm. and specifically, we would like to also hear from you some remarks on uh, the support you are providing to this very interesting approach of climate resilient water safety planning and uh, sanitation safety planning. So the floor is yours, Rory. And thanks for joining. Okay, many thanks for the introduction, Jose. And uh, hello to everyone from a, a very wet and windy west of Ireland. So we're very grateful for the opportunity to share some of WHO's practical experiences on how we've been integrating climate resilience into our global water and sanitation programs. So we've been working since about 2013 on various aspects of climate resilient wash through two separate UK government funded projects in both Africa and Asia. Now, central to this work has been the, the practical integration of climate considerations into our water and sanitation safety planning frameworks. And these, as many of you will know, are central recommendations in WHO's guidelines for both drinking water quality, as well as sanitation and health. Now, the first phase of this work ran from 2013 to 2018. And we gained some initial practical experiences with the development of our climate resilient water safety plan approach. And this was particularly in Bangladesh, Ethiopia and Nepal. Now, one of the key learnings that I'd like to share from this program was what we found the, the critical importance of embedding the water safety plan approach within national strategic frameworks to ensure longer term sustainability of the program. So we saw this explicitly through the development of Ethiopia's strategic framework for climate resilient water safety planning, and then the subsequent uptake into the National One WASH program uh, to ensure both ongoing visibility of the program and also adequate resource allocation to ensure that scale up of climate resilient water safety plans was sustainable over the longer term. And I think this has been very clearly echoed uh, by our colleagues in Eritrea and uh, that the importance of making sure that it's embedded within uh, national programs for ongoing uh, implementation. Now, the second phase of our climate resilient wash work began more recently in 2019, and it's currently running till next year. Now, this in some respects is a continuation of our previous work but it afforded us a great opportunity to take stock of some of the important barriers to successful uh, water safety plan implementation with that particular focus on climate resilience. 
Now we took this stock take by building national capacity for audit teams to conduct what we consider to be supportive assessments uh, of existing pilot climate resilient water safety plans. And this was through a national program of water safety plan auditing in some of our target project countries. So taking the learnings from this audit program, uh, we got a great opportunity then to develop tailored practical guidance materials and training programs. And these were tailored to meet the needs of countries to overcome the specific challenges that we were able to identify through the program of auditing. Now this work has further emphasized uh, the importance of developing tailored national materials based on robust country piloting experiences. So this will really help to make sure that either the water or sanitation safety plan approach is appropriately adapted to the national context, which we have found in many settings is really key to successful uptake and also implementation over the longer term. Now, we don't have time today, unfortunately, to go into detail of all of the learnings uh, from this audit program, but one of the most significant barriers that we found uh, was how WSP teams uh, for water safety planning, and this is also applicable to sanitation safety planning, so how the teams on the ground can effectively access and integrate the very complex sometimes and also overwhelming climate data and information sources are out there. I've seen this issue raised a little bit through the, the chat box about data and analysis and how we go about it. So in many of the contexts that we've worked in, um, access to climate expertise is really easier said than done. And we've found that this can significantly hamper how uh, robust water safety plans or sanitation safety plans can be developed that really meet the priority investment needs of a particular system with regards to them building resilience. So to address this capacity gap, uh, WHO, we've been working on two practical guidance notes that I'd briefly like to give just a special mention. The first resource focuses on guidance for WSP teams to access and integrate climate information within the water safety plan framework. So we're aiming to give practical stepwise guidance for water suppliers to be able to understand what their key climate information needs might be, where they can access this information and how to integrate it effectively within the WSP uh, system assessment and framework. So we're going to be providing checklist style questions, which will direct users to a corresponding spectrum that of various climate information sources. And this will be aligned to water safety plan team capacity, their resources and the available access to external expert support. So this will be very much in line with the, the WSP philosophy of starting simple uh, based on available capacity and resources with uh, a, a drive to increase and improve incrementally over time. Now linked to this, I'll just briefly mention the second resource. Uh, this will be focusing on guidance for conducting climate change and wash vulnerability and adaptation assessments. So again, the focus will be on simple practical tools to assess vulnerability and facilitate uh, adaptation to support countries to develop resilient water and sanitation services. Now, similar to the work that Dauda has presented earlier, uh, we also recognize the importance of having these assessments as flexible and being able to apply them at various scales. So this can inform national, subnational, uh, climate resilient policy, preparedness and planning, but also support local level water and sanitation safety planning efforts. So we're hoping that these two resources will better support national programming as well as practices in lower resource settings so we can identify the priority investment needs to build resilient water and sanitation services. So this in turn should ensure that limited available finances will target the greatest needs and provide the best return on investment in terms of public health protection into the future. And also keeping in mind, of course, that water and sanitation safety planning can be very useful tools to leverage funding from both national and international climate linked funding mechanisms. And I believe that this will be uh, an important consideration that will be explored a little bit further in the, the third webinar. I just finish up by mentioning also that our current uh, water safety plan and sanitation safety plan manuals 
are being separately revised by WHO at the moment, and these will include a much greater emphasis on climate considerations. So ultimately, they'll reflect the lessons that we've learned since our work started in 2013 on how best to integrate climate resiliation into safe drinking water and sanitation programming. And we hope that both of these revised manuals will be available publicly, certainly by mid-2022. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share some of our, um, yeah, our experiences in this sphere. Back to you, Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. That was um, very well um, articulated and, and you have made great uh, linkages as well with what we discussed last week on Webinar 1. Uh, the tools that you have described, as you said, they, they, they are also tools uh, to facilitate entry points into climate policy at the national level. Uh, and as you say, working with this will facilitate and demonstrate the climate rationale and the climate narrative of was interventions that will be then able to tap into the climate financing uh, in, in the WAS sector, which, uh, as we know at the moment, is uh, lagging uh, well behind of uh, what we think it should be the appropriate levels of climate financing for our sector. Um, what I would like to invite you, if you like, also to, to share the links in the chat box to these two documents and frameworks that you have shared. So please, if, uh, if you have them available, just uh, you could copy the, the links in, in the chat box. And, uh, yeah, Rory, you wanted to say something? Hey, thanks. Yeah, just to mention the two uh, materials I mentioned are in development uh, at the moment. Ah, uh, mm. So, but we'll be yeah very keen to uh, identify a, a number of speakers from today to provide feedback in due course. But we do have a number of existing uh, climate resilient water safety plan tools and resources that I'd be very happy to share. I'll pop those in the link for you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rory. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, I'm uh, happy to see the interaction in the chat box and please in the, in the last part of this webinar, if, if you can continue interacting, that will be great. I see questions that are being also answered and, and discussions that are being taken forward. So we really encourage you to continue using the chat box. And now we move into um, our second discussion for this webinar. Joao, please, if you can... Um, Pass the slide, thank you. So now we have with us Jonathan Farr, who is a senior climate advisor at Water Aid. Um, and we will ask uh, Jonathan to do a little bit uh, the same, to reflect a little bit on the themes that you have heard during this webinar, and also to share some remarks on another very interesting uh, framework that, that it's um, there to, to help us uh, with the integration of climate resilience into WAS and to position WAS into climate policy. Uh, this is the water aid water security framework. Um, um, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Uh, hi there. Uh, and first of all, uh, it's great to be here. And thank you, Jose, and to your colleagues for organizing these uh, series of workshops. Um, and first of all, I wanted to say that it's been really good listening for the last hour or so. For, I mean, how, how many different sort of the breadth of work that's going on and the different approaches. It often, uh, you know, working in a single organization. You're never clear if the sort of you know the, the struggles that you're dealing with are being felt by the people and it's really heartening to see that this sort of sector as a whole is is stepping up and i think uh, you know, swa's coordination has also helped to um you know to sort of rally that that uh, that movement uh, as we go forward um uh it, the war security framework first of all you know i mean this conversation is about climate change but you know, from water trade's perspective, of course, you know, climate change is a factor of all of, of total water security, which is why we call it the water security framework, because it doesn't help us to separate that as a separate issue. But of course, we recognize that there are specific aspects of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the warming world, which will continue to cause um, you know, severe problems in the areas where we work, especially in Africa and South Asia, where there's the evidence is there right now to, for all to see. And this framework is an attempt to sort of situate our work on WASH uh, in this bigger picture. So it's not just how do we keep wash, wash services going, you know, in terms of the infrastructure or the, where they are, but in terms of the wider picture and threats to the water, you know, water resources, um, you know, environmental um, challenges, and of course, just keeping basic services, uh, you know, uh, developing and moving forward uh, in pace with, you know, in, to keep pace with the changes in society. Um, so just to quickly summarize our focus, um, 
within water, so to, 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 to where we place ourselves in that water security uh, framework is meeting basic human needs such as drinking, cooking, bathing, hygiene, uh, and also we ext have extended this to the provision of small scale livelihood activities and eco uh, ecosystem services. And with, but the framework also recognizes that, of course, the big water users, agriculture, but also energy, uh, um, the natural environment, uh, and industry um, will have a huge impact on how you know how wash is provided and, and the water available for that wash as well. Uh, and generally, of course, as I said, whilst climate change receives a lot of publicity, um, we also have to acknowledge the risks from pollution, geogenic, geogenic contamination and higher demands due to increased population density and of course the floods and droughts uh, and over extraction caused by uh, climate variability. Um, and we, the way we see climate change is as a threat multiplier for all these, um, these uh, problems. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, you know, what does water trade, what do we do in our programs about this? Well, um, in the water security framework, and I'll share the link in the chat after I finish speaking, um, you know, we give some examples and guides for our work in South Asia and West Africa. And today I just can talk briefly about the sort of work we're doing in West Africa. Uh, we've been working in about 30 or 40 communities over the last um, uh, sort of seven or eight years, I think, um, to build community-based water resource, man resource management practices. Uh, and that means, first of all, and this is absolutely key to, what we, to, how, to how we work, and it's you know, similar to the work that what everyone else has been saying for this, is this risk analysis. And particularly for us, it's bringing the water users together in a community to uh, map water resources, talk about how that water is used, so the supply and demand, but also, you know, drawing on local knowledge and lo no local understanding of what those threats might be. And of course, we provide, you know, we're water aid, we provide technical insights as well. But we, you know, we're creating a, a, a local dialogue about water security. Um, and then, and then to, to um, add to that, of course, because even, you know, even local community won't know everything about uh, the, you know, the, the issues which they face, we build up that local capacity to monitor and manage uh, some of the threats. So, and this can be very simple, such as uh, you know, we get people to um, you know, take, take daily measurements of rainfall levels and daily measurements of borehole depth to monitor over time the relationship between the direct relationship between climate and water availability. So it doesn't help you know in day one, but after these you know seven or eight years been going, we've got a you've got beautiful time series data about the interaction between you know when is it raining a lot or not a lot, and how much water is available for people to use and how much has been drawn down from available water supplies. Uh, and actually, interesting on these on, on these on this time series, sometimes the data is not available, and that also tells you something about you know the risks from flooding to the water points because people just can't access them to take the me measurements. And then lastly, we're using this locally led analysis and information to adjust our programs over time and to inspire further development of services in response to climate impacts. So maybe it's decided we need new to site new boreholes. Maybe it's we need greater water storage at certain times. Maybe we need to change community practices um, or the community, the community, we don't change them, the community change themselves to respond to you know, areas of high water stress, times of high water stress. But this is the, you know, the, the whole uh, um, the main outcome of this is it's building up the community's ability to be resilient and to understand its relationship to water availability. And this also links with our sustainability work. And we do make distinctions between sustainability and resilience, um, such as, but we, you know, we strengthen local governments of water, of, you know, water use. Um, we strengthen supply chains for wash services and water inf infrastructure, and we promote inclusiveness so that, you know, when we have this discussion, it's not just three or four people, it's we're, try, you know, we're trying to bring major water users, which is usually women who may be marginalized, but we try to make sure they're part of the conversation and, un and understand because it's, it's often there to be the most effective by changes, works by climate change or other things. And it also, again, just gets those groups recognized as you know their right to water is as important to anyone else's. And lastly, the, the main benefits of this is of course that as communities uh, have more informed decisions and more data about their water infrastructure and its and services and its availability, they're able to advocate on their own behalf for, you know, if there's local finance available, if there's, you know, if there's politicians they need to speak to, if there's other systems they need to get involved in, then they will, you know, they'll they'll raise those issues and you know, it doesn't it doesn't they don't have to rely on water aid to um, do all this work. Um, and so that's just one of the sort of main approaches we're taking at a local level to inspire action on you know, inspire understanding of the relationship between climate change and wash. 
while of course you know, ensuring that sustainability and 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 thing, which is should be best practice across the whole sector anyway, is you know remains as high quality as we can. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was also very very useful, and you have uh, uh, bring to our attention another way of uh, practically working with climate resilient was approaches specifically at the local and the community level um, thankfully if you want to paste on the chat box um, the references that you were mentioning um, we are concluding now our webinar just to say that there have been very interesting uh, questions uh, on the chat box that re refer to the depth uh, of the risk analysis and the methodologies that have been explained. How long does it take to um, conduct these uh, approaches? Um, they have been answers uh, on the chat box as well, referring to the flexibility of the tools that have been presented uh, to be used in terms of the scope for national and subnational but also the depth and depending on something which has been also highlighted in the chat box, which is the lack of data. You know, in some cases, how are these risk analysis going to be conducted if there is a lack of data? Just understanding these data gaps is also an interesting way to move forward and propose activities towards climate resilience is covering exactly covering those uh, data gaps. Uh, we have, we, we got during today different references for tools, approaches, methodologies that we hope uh, you found uh, useful. Uh, and I would like just to close this webinar with um, um, what it was a question by Katerina Fonseca on the, um, on the chat box that I'm going to turn into a reflection for all of us when we leave this webinar today. Katerina was very well um, making this reflection in the chat box um, about we've been talking about uh, joint planning and engagement of stakeholders within the sector. We've been also talking about participatory approaches for risk assessment. But the question and the reflection for all of us to take with us is how many of the stakeholders are actually from other line ministries beyond water, sanitation, and hygiene? And which line ministries um, are we talking about? So this is exactly the same way I started when uh, I was reviewing the flow chart and I started to talk about the stakeholder mapping because this is this uh, call for looking beyond the usual suspects or beyond, beyond the usual uh, stakeholders that we normally work with. As we need to uh, integrate climate resilience, we need to go beyond and um, go wider in our scope. We need to strengthen discussions with ministries of environments, the um, directorates and um, departments working with climate resilience, with disaster risk reduction, etc. And also looking at the interaction with uh, national, local, subnational river basin levels, etc. We hope that you found the webinar today um, useful. And we can have the next slide. We are looking forward to having you with us again next week it will be on thursday next week the webinar on the 29th where we will be um, diving in into climate resilient uh, was financing so bye for now and we hope that you enjoy and you found this webinar useful thank you very much thank you bye, -bye.